I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. Today on ABC News Live, new details on the shooting rampage at a July 4th parade. The accused gunman has been charged with seven counts of first-degree murder. Investigators say he planned the attack for weeks and even dressed as a woman to escape more easily. Now new questions are emerging about missed red flags as we learn more about those killed, including the mother and father separated from their toddler during the shooting. An ABC News exclusive interview, the sister of Jalen Walker is speaking out after the release of body camera footage from the night police killed her brother in a hail of bullets. We also have new developments in the growing legal battles after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. We'll break down the new court ruling blocking a so-called trigger law from taking effect. But we begin with the latest on that July 4th mass shooting. The suspect is being arraigned in court today. He's now charged with seven counts of first degree murder one for each person killed in the rampage. This as we learn more about how police say he carried out the attack. ABC's Alex Perez is in Highland Park with the latest. The suspected shooter who opened fire during a 4th of July celebration in Highland Park, Illinois, now charged with seven counts of first degree murder, one for each person killed in the rampage. Police say 21-year-old Robert Cremo unloaded 70 rounds on people at the parade, killing seven and injuring more than 30 in an attack authorities say he had planned for weeks, even escaping, according to investigators, in disguise, dressed as a woman. Investigators do believe he did this to conceal his facial tattoos and his identity and help him during the escape with the other people who were fleeing the chaos. <laughs> Police say the suspected gunman climbed up a fire escape ladder onto the roof of a business to open fire. Parade goers running for their lives. Marcy Kamen just narrowly dodged one of those bullets. Her father hit in the shoulder. He thankfully survived. So there was a bullet that literally almost hit your head. It hit my dad, but it missed my head. This is why I have the gratitude, right, that life can change in an instant. And now this morning, growing questions about missed red flags. Overnight, Illinois police saying the suspect passed four background checks in 2020 and 2021, despite two prior police incidents. In 2019, when he threatened to take his own life, and that September, when police say family members accused him of threatening to kill people with knives. The threat was directed at family inside of the home. So at that time, there was no information that he possessed any firearms. Now, sources telling ABC News investigators are pouring over social media posts believed to be from the suspect dating back over a year ago. One video even showing part of the parade route. The suspect leaving a disturbing trail of posts online on sites like YouTube, Discord and TikTok. Some of that content removed in the wake of the deadly shooting. The suspected shooter also using weapons he had obtained legally, including that assault-style rifle that is legal in parts of Illinois, but not in Highland Park. Two of the weapons were obtained within the region here. Those were two of the rifles. The rifle used in the attack was purchased by him. Vice President Kamala Harris visiting the community, meeting with the mayor and law enforcement, calling for stricter gun laws. There is no reason that we have weapons of war on the streets of America. If convicted on those first-degree murder charges, the suspect could face a life in prison without parole. <clears throat> All right, Alex Perez in Highland Park, thank you. And for more on this, let's bring in ABC News contributor and former NYPD chief of detectives Bob Boyce, as well as ABC's Alex Prochet in Washington. Uh, Bob, the suspect here is supposed to appear in court today. What can we expect from that? I don't think you can expect too much at all. In fact, uh, you're just going to see him. His attorney will speak to him, uh, speak with him, and that's it. I don't expect him to say anything, although I hear he's cooperating with the police. So uh, what we are going to hear from the DA is what they've uncovered so far, and that's what I'm really interested in right now. Uh, Alex, Vice President Kamala Harris visited the scene of the shooting last night and called for a ban on assault weapons. The president just signed this bipartisan uh, gun bill into law. Is there more that can be done here? Is this a realistic call from the vice president? 
Well, right now, Diane, it doesn't look like there is enough momentum or will on Capitol Hill to have an assault weapons ban uh, or, or even or even to raise the age limit uh, on, only, or on buying an assault weapon from 18 to 21. We saw that with this bipartisan negotiation, this latest law that went in federally, uh, there was a lot of negotiation, a lot of Democrats uh, wanting some something to be done specifically about these assault style weapons. Uh, but but frankly, there is just not enough uh, support from from Republicans to get something passed. And Robert, investigators are now looking into multiple social media posts believed to be from the suspect. There are also questions about how he passed a background check given a suicide attempt followed by a police phone call from his family in 2019 saying he was threatening to kill everyone. Um, so when you put that all together, do you think there were red flags missed here? I think missed opportunities for sure. I'll look at the timeline. In uh, April of 2019, they, he gets called to the house for a suicide attempt. Um, that's documented, and that should have been looked at when you when you go forward in this in this uh, application for a gun license. September 2019, he the same thing. They recover 16 knives. He threatens people in the house. A domestic incident report should have been prepared and should have been part of the investigation. Just two months later, his father sponsors a, a request for a, a firearms license. Two months later, after he knew all these things, and yet the family said they're surprised by this. So it's, it's really some disturbing stuff here that doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, so there's a lot of things you could do when you when you want to do it. And the state does the application the proper forms. I think it's much better off with the local police. They know what's going on. They should be in charge. Now, I know you've investigated a lot of shootings. Police in this case say that the suspect disguised himself in women's clothing to try to escape. But they also say he left behind a legally purchased gun, and ultimately they were able to trace that gun back to him, which is how they were able to make this arrest so quickly. What do you think when you see that? Did he want to get caught? I just think he was sloppy. I, I really do. And, uh, and I don't think anybody thinks this guy's a great mind at all, but he is a hater. And you see it on, on the, he radicalizes on the internet. So I don't think he was thinking about it at all, about it coming back to him. That second weapon would have, you know, might have killed police officers trying to appre apprehend him. It was in the car. That was his secondary weapon. He was ready to use it. I'm sure it was loaded and ready to go. So this was all planned out by this individual. It all out like in a blaze of glory. He didn't. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I think he found like-minded people on the Internet, which drove him to this point. Uh, and, Bob, I have to ask you, there's been a lot of conversation given the story of Jalen Walker, uh, who was shot and killed by police in Akron, Ohio. So many people are now, are now asking, how does a, a mass shooter, a suspected mass shooter at least, who is thought to have killed several people, taken into police custody peacefully, and then somebody else during a traffic stop uh, they're saying Jalen Walker was unarmed when he was shot. They say they found a gun in the car, but he was unarmed when he actually was shot. How does someone like that end up getting fired upon with, you know, just something like 90 bullets? Can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. To two totally different incidents at that point. It was a summary um, attempted apprehension on Mr. Walker. Um, he saw the firearm in the car um, with, his, uh, with a wedding ring there. It, it really tells us something about fr our frame of mind at that point. They recovered a shell uh, from the street where he was um, shot at the police. Uh, the gun was there. Uh, I don't think he was acting rationally at that point. And that's just what we have right now. Now, as far as the contagious shooting thereafter, with the number of rounds that were fired at him, uh, that's a problem with policing that we've had for a while. Um, he ran out of the car as the car was moving. You're in real time here. You're running. Um, you don't know what you're seeing is dark out. I think the fact that once we take the air out of this thing, let, let investigators investigate it forward, and we'll see what happens then. But right now, it's way too early in this investigation, and it's just two diverse, conflicting accounts. We really have to sit back and have an independent review to see what's going on in the Walker case. So can you compare that for me to cases like we saw here in Highland Park and like in Buffalo, where a suspected mass shooter is able to be apprehended peacefully? Uh, I don't know if peacefully is the answer. I saw him thrown on the ground and, and, and arrested. So I don't know if that's peacefully or not. But uh, he, and he did, did have a gun, but he surrendered. And uh, compliant with the direct orders of the police at that moment is the issue. Be compliant uh, with, with verbal commands. And these things, generally speaking, um, it's, it's taking something like this. If you saw the, um, the Buffalo shooter, he shot it out with a, with a security guard, a retired police officer, who, who gave his life for other people. 
So, so it's two, two different issues and you really can't conflate them. All right. And we are now just getting a look at the booking photo of that suspect who was arrested in this shooting in Highland Park, Illinois. There is the suspect right now accused of seven counts of first degree murder as it stands. But prosecutors, Alex, say that they plan to file additional charges. What's the latest on that? Well, Diane, keep in mind that, yes, he had those seven deaths, but uh, there were at least 38 people injured during this attack. So there could be additional charges associated with that. And I think also, you know, keep in mind that uh, the, the feds are going to be watching this. And if they determine motive for particular statutes, there could be federal charges in this as well. All right. Robert Boyce, Alex Prache, thank you both. And we were just talking a little bit about the Jalen Walker case. Jalen Walker's sister is now speaking out in an ABC News exclusive interview after he was killed in a hail of bullets fired by Akron, Ohio police officers. This is newly released body camera footage of the incident, and it's raising questions and setting off protests and calls for accountability. Jalen's sister, though, says she hasn't seen this video yet, and she's telling our TJ Holmes why. I won't see him again. I won't be able to hug him again or just remind them that I love him or anything like that. Jada Walker is preparing to bury her baby brother. Speaking to ABC News for the first time since Akron police released body camera video showing eight of their officers shooting and killing 25-year-old Jalen Walker. Now, you know that video is out there. Are you just not ready to see it yet? It's just not matching the person that I know because he's not into that, and that's not him. That's not Jalen, and I can't accept that at all, and I don't, I shouldn't say I don't want to, but I just can't fathom to see any sort of video of him being gunned down that amount of times, you know, as if he was just, just like aim practice. The footage shows what authorities describe as a routine traffic stop, followed by a car chase, then foot chase. As Walker runs away, officers claim at one point he turns towards them, prompting a hail of gunfire. A preliminary medical examiner report shows over 60 wounds to Walker's body, despite being unarmed at the moment he was killed. But police say Walker fired at them during the car chase and point to this image, which they say shows a flash of a gun from the driver's side of Walker's car, adding that they recovered this gun and a loaded magazine inside of his car. The way in which that picture um, depicted where the gun was located and the way in the manner in which it was placed Officers are approaching the car on their body-worn camera, and it's capturing it in, in, as they are approaching. You are not, um, sounds like you're not buying, but also you don't see evidence that a gun was ever fired from that vehicle. I've never known him to own a gun of any sort at all. He never brought it to my attention. The last thing I would have imagined him having with him is a gun. I don't see clear evidence of a gun being fired. And more importantly, the gun was recovered in the back seat, according to the preliminary autopsy report that my team reviewed. So I need to know how the gun got in the front seat. All nice presented with the ring and the, car, you know, the, 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 um, the cartridge pulled out and the bullets there. It, this looked like a staged picture. ABC News has reached out to the Attorney General's office regarding the photo, but have not heard back. The family says police are creating a narrative that makes Walker out to be someone that he wasn't. I really haven't been watching a lot of television or publications on things because I just, I don't want to see him in that light. I'm just really sad because, like I said, out of many black men who, who have been killed and many families who experience this, even as a sister, you know, it's just... <sighs> Excuse me, it's just, it's really hard. Black lives, they matter here. Walker's death ignited protests. No justice, no peace. As an outraged community and grieving family await answers from the investigation now underway. We still have yet to get a solid answer as to how, uh, like you said, a person who doesn't have any record, at the most will have a speeding ticket, you know, from using his car to get around for me to have to experience that and see my family, you know, mourn, even my mom, you know, it really hurts. 
And TJ Holmes joins me now for more on that exclusive interview. TJ, what stood out from you from this conversation with Jada Walker? Uh, you, you can't make sense, Diane, of the, uh, when you try to juxtapose the two storylines that you're getting. This, this kid has never been in trouble before, who has maybe had a speeding ticket, who uh, now is going to have a routine traffic stop to the story that police are saying, which is that a, this guy took off and was shooting at police while he was driving. Those two things just don't match up at all. So there are questions about exactly what was going on to make this young man um, that certainly his sister knows and knows fondly, knows well, um, but, but it just, to them, so much confusion about why he would behave in such a way on something as routine, as uh, just a routine traffic stop, maybe having to do with a, a taillight or something being out, ends up uh, with 60 wounds to his body, with eight officers opening fire. It just doesn't make sense. So to hear, what stood out to me, just to hear from the family, to hear from his sister, just how confusing this is, um, that the behavior that they're describing of, um, of, of Jalen. And I know his sister is not the only one who's described Jalen as a peaceful person. Again, uh, painting sort of this contrasting picture to what police are saying happened on that day. We also heard the family attorney, Bobby DiCello, they're telling you that he's now calling into question this photo that was taken of the gun that police say they found in Jalen's car. So where does this investigation go from here? Well, the officers, the, the eight that fired, they are on leave now. This is going to be handed over to a, uh, an independent uh, outlet to do an investigation. But for now, um, no, the two sides are now going to be speaking a lot because this is going to come down to a lot of, as we've seen, these th things unfortunately play out so much in media before they end up possibly playing out in a court of law. Um, but his family is very determined to get the message out and to also get answers to their questions. You mentioned that photo. I think you all have, have shown plenty of the 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 gun and a loaded clip and his ring neatly placed in the vehicle. Um, after this frantic police chase and after he jumped out of the car, well, how, well, how are these things so carefully placed? And that's what the family is questioning. Um, was that photo, flat out said, has this photo been staged? They also questioned whether or not that was an actual flash of a gun coming from, um, coming from the vehicle. So um, we have to wait. Uh, there are going to be more answers, but right now we got more questions, as we often see, Diane, in, in cases like this. And unfortunately, we've seen far too many of them. Yeah, a lot left to be uncovered in this investigation. T.J. Holmes, we appreciate you keeping track of it for us. Thank you. You got it, Diane. Coming up, the FDA has suspended its ban on Juul cigarettes. We'll have the latest on that when we come back. Welcome back to ABC News Live. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he plans to remain in power after the resignations of two of his top cabinet ministers and other more junior officials. Johnson's chief, uh, Treasury Chief and Health Secretary quit yesterday, saying they could no longer support him because of his handling of ethics scandals. They include the case of a senior official accused of sexual misconduct. The FDA has suspended its ban on Juul e-cigarettes. Last month, the agency ordered the popular vaping company to pull its electronic cigarettes off the market due to insufficient information about the potential risks. To continue sales, e-cigarette companies uh, would have to prove that they benefit public health, but a federal appeals court has temporarily blocked that ban until further review. 85,000 people have been forced to evacuate or be ready to leave due to a flooding emergency in Australia. The evacuations come after days of torrential rain. The country has had four major floods since March of last year. And history has been made in the hockey world. The San Jose Sharks have hired former player Mike Greer as the first black general manager in the NHL. Greer retired in 2011 after 14 seasons in the league where he played for four teams, including the Sharks. Coming up, the growing legal battle in one state after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. What we're learning about the latest court ruling in the fight against a so-called trigger law when we come back. Welcome back. A hearing is scheduled for today on the ACLU and Planned Parenthood's request for a temporary injunction to
to block a near total abortion ban in Kentucky. A judge has already temporarily blocked that ban, allowing abortions to resume in the state pending further litigation. It's one of several legal abortion battles across the country. In Florida, a judge has blocked a state law banning abortions after 15 weeks. Bans in Louisiana and Utah have also been temporarily blocked in court. But late Friday, the Texas Supreme Court blocked a lower court order that said clinics could resume providing abortion services. I'd like to bring in interim dean and professor at Temple University School of Law, Rachel Rebouchet, for more on this. Uh, professor, thank you so much for being here. What's happening at this hearing today? Why is this so important? It's important because it's going to set the tone for potential litigation across the country. Um, the ACLU making the argument that the state constitution, uh, which extends beyond rights that are in the federal constitution in this in this realm, uh, protects Kentuckians' rights to abortion. Uh, that that right in the state constitution to bodily autonomy uh, should apply statewide and should strike down the abortion ban. They're hoping that a court agrees and issues a more permanent injunction or a, a, an injunction with more teeth um, and. And it's a strategy that we're going to see in different states across the country moving forward. Now, other states have passed new abortion restrictions. Mississippi has one that goes into effect uh, tomorrow. It's another near total ban. How could this case set a precedent for some of these other uh, legal cases around the country? I think they give us a sample of what to expect as the legal landscape after Dobbs, the case that overturned Roe v. Wade, the case that turned returned abortion law back to the states, of what to expect in state courts. Now, the Mississippi challenge will be based on Mississippi law, like the Kentucky challenge is based on the Kentucky Constitution. But this is the kind of strategy to expect as states start to enact and then implement these near total bans on abortion. Now, how are these legal proceedings impacting women who are trying to get abortions right now? So I think it's creating a ton of confusion. I think that there is this you know, flickering status of abortion being illegal, legal, uh, available one day, Dobbs comes down, maybe not available the next, depending on the state you're in, challenge in court one day, a ruling the next that's reinstating services. I think there's there's, it's not just a complicated legal landscape, but it's it's confusing about when you're going to get be able to get an appointment. Will that clinic be able to stay open in light of the law being enforced or a challenge uh, being uh, launched? Um, will you have to travel? How will you get there? There are so many questions, logistical questions, just questions about where is abortion legal in your state that we'll see continue apace in these next weeks and months. And what about for women crossing state lines to get abortions? Could that somehow result in a legal penalty? So I think no state has passed the law yet that punishes providers, abortion providers, for instance, that are in another state providing legal abortions to someone from Texas or Missouri crossing state lines in order to seek those services elsewhere. But we certainly see it trickling to the surface, um, model legislation being posed by National Right to Life that would penalize people who are helping minors cross state lines. Um, a bill proposed in Missouri this spring that sought to punish providers out of state who are providing abortions to Missouri citizens. These laws, make no mistake, have lots of constitutional problems under our federal constitution. We have a right to travel in this country. States can't really impede interstate commerce in certain ways, but that's not to say all it's undeveloped and there's a lot of open-ended questions. All right, Professor Rachel Rebouchet, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. I'm Diane Macedo. Stay with us as ABC News Live continues with more news, context, and analysis. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.